let's talk about the cellular basis for supplementation, particularly in the setting of cardiovascular health. And I find this um, very interesting, and it's been enough to persuade me to supplement on certain things and to encourage or offer my patients the opportunity to supplement on the same things, and um, I'll show you what those are. So, supplementing for muscle energy. This is, a, this is a schematic that I drew, so excuse my artwork, of a muscle cell focusing on the areas where we can supplement to potentially improve function. So the whole thing is the cell. The cell wants over 60% fat energy, less than 40% glucose energy to function. L-carnitine is a molecule that helps pull the fat from the cell into the mitochondria, which is the engine, the boiler room of that cell where energy is really produced. So I have L-carnitine pulling in the preferred substrate and helps shuttling out the um, breakdown products after um, the energy has been used. We have the substrates for cellular energy, which are gonna be used to make the ATP molecules, which are the real energy dollar that that cell uses to actually um, function and to um, have energy re readily available. And there are substrates here that we can, fuels that we can supplement on to facilitate that process. Coenzyme Q10, where does coenzyme Q10 act? It acts on the membrane of the mitochondria to facilitate formation of those substrates into the energy molecule. So we can supplement on coenzyme Q10 also to facilitate that energy producing process. And then cells are full of magnesium full of magnesium. And what does magnesium do? It electrically balances those ATP molecules so the, sh the, the cell can shuttle that energy currency wherever it needs to, um, to have energy at whatever location for its metabolic processes. So we have four supplement targets that can improve certainly cardiac muscle health and um, skeletal muscle health um, as well. And let's take a closer look at those things. Um, a little bit more appreciation on heart structure and energetics. And I love it that my animations are, are working today. So here we have an organ level heart. There's your heart. If um, you crack someone's chest and open it open and, and um, pry it open with these um, metal forceps, you can see your heart you know, beating inside your chest. And that's the view of the cardiac surgeon. And there you see that organ um, contracting in real time just as rapidly as it does. We know the microstructure of that is these bands of muscle cells. They're collected in fibers. And each of those small fibers is, in fact, a cell that's undergoing this contraction process. In clusters of cells, it moves like this. And so this is in real time, just as your heart is beating. And what it really is, is the individual cells all together contracting in unison um, in a synchronized fashion to generate that overall heart pumping ability. And we think our heart does this 100,000 times a day on average. It's got to keep that up for your entire life. You tend to think anything you can do to make that process easier would tend to benefit you. Um, so let's just appreciate the level of function we're dealing with. We said in the cell are these engines, and there's several engines, and they're called the mitochondria, and that's actually where the energy currency for that contraction process is produced. So 5,000 of these mitochondria per heart cell, it's 35% of this heart cell volume, produces 90% of the energy, produces ATP, and when ATP is burned as fuel, it regenerates it so you can use it again. Uh, so we're gonna focus on mitochondrial health. These are very interesting structures. They contain their own DNA and they have um, created themselves and they're by their own or they're responsible for their own generation in your cells and they completely regulate their own processes with their own DNA. Interestingly, um, all the DNA for your mitochondria you have inherited from your mother. So your dad may look like a Chevy, you may look like a Chevy, you may feel like a Chevy, act like a Chevy. If your mother's a Honda, it's a Honda engine that's under your hood. So just so you know, okay? Um, so interestingly, the DNA in your mitochondria are relatively unprotected. So they're vulnerable to damage from free radicals and oxidative stress. And if they damage over time, that's gonna degrade the function of the mitochondria or your engines. Your engines are gonna start to fail at the cellular level. So the mitochondria require a high level of um, antioxidant, um, production or antioxidant protection. So a few more basics. Um, 
The mitochondria health requires respiration, requires oxygen, produces carbon dioxide and water. That's why we breathe and that's why we pee. Very efficient energy process, but every time, 2 to 5% of oxygen is not efficiently used but becomes a toxic free radical. And those toxic free radicals are overproduced during disease states and stress. They can damage your mitochondria and the damage eventually begins to corrupt genetic information. Mitochondrial damage has been proposed to be the real reason why we age and die prematurely. And there are demonstrations that there's extensive premature cell death as a major cause of unexplained congestive heart failure. And that's very interesting in my specialty. And this can be seen particularly in women in their seventh and eighth decade. So there's a reason throughout life to be protecting your mitochondria to the degree that you can. So we can think about dietary and supplemental antioxidants for this region, for this reason, to protect the DNA from free radical, function, from free radical damage, to preserve mitochondrial function, to preserve cellular function and lifespan, to preserve your function and lifespan. So we see the mitochondria being important. And this is kind of how it works. We're constantly bombarded by free radical stress, ultraviolet light from the sun, ionizing radiation from industrial processes, smoking, including secondhand smoke. There's air pollution, um, your own white blood cells fighting infection and inflammation, and your own mitochondrial engines not burning completely efficiently and generating a few toxic metabolites of their own. You know, in our, in our longevity talk, we'll see that one of the rules of the centenarians is eat until you're 80% full. Why? Because you don't want your engines running hotter than they need to run. So if you really are full, when you feel 80% full, stop eating. Because whatever else you eat, your engines are going to have to burn. And by burning, they're going to run hotter, longer, and generate more free radicals, which over your lifespan are going to add up a start to encroach on your lifespan. So all these um, free radical molecules cause DNA damage. They're damaging your genetic information. And as soon as they are produced, and as soon as we're exposed to them, we ha need to have antioxidants on board to quickly mop them up. So here we see an apple that's been sliced, and a little bit later it shows what the process of oxidation can do. And you can imagine these sorts of things happening in your body, and for us to be in a constant state of um, needing protection from these stresses which are, you know, ultimately um, unavoidable. So cellular energy and um, antioxidant production, you can think here oxygen become unbalanced mo molecules which are free radicals, they're attacking your cells, and then we have antioxidant substances like some of the vitamins C and E and then products in our plants, cruciferous phytonutrients, carotenoids, flavonoids, um, all mopping up those oxidant species as quickly as they can. And what they're in fact doing is for this free radical that has an unpaired electron, which is causing the damage, these antioxidants are quickly able to supply those electrons so that um, free radical becomes balanced, electrically balanced, and no longer dangerous. You can think of the free radical as an unprotected buzzsaw, um, you know, flying through your cell and your system like an unguided missile and your antioxidants like kamikaze pilots um, attacking these to electrically balance them and provide you with um, antioxidant protection. And we said yesterday, you know, LDL cholesterol, it's not the LDL cholesterol, it's the oxidized LDL cholesterol. So when that cholesterol has become damaged by free radicals, does it become most pathologic? So it's not just your cholesterol level, it's how well you're actually um, protecting your cholesterol from, from having this damage and um, becoming um, pathologic to you. So optimizing cellular energy and longevity, sort of our grand unified theory is we are fighting inflammation, we are mopping up free radicals with the goal of improving our longevity by preserving mitochondrial function. That's um, what this business is all about. You know, keep the main thing the main thing, this is the main thing. So how do we maximize our mitochondrial function? We've talked about using high quality fuels, plant-based whole food, organic diets, high quality fats, the mono and polyunsaturated, and then there's a rule here too for supplementation. And I'm gonna name four that we'll talk about first, coenzyme Q10, magnesium, ribose sugar, and carnitine. And then we're minimizing mitochondrial damage all along with our antioxidants, which are contained largely in these great foods that we're eating and facilitated and supplemented by a supplement regimen that we might consider. So we really owe our 
the focus on these particular agents to uh, Dr. Stephen Sinatra, who is a cardiologist on the East Coast, and um, he's really reviewed the basic science behind some of these things and been able to make clinical recommendations in terms of dosing. And the coenzyme Q10, magnesium, L-carnitine, and ribose are what he calls his awesome foursome for, um, for cardiovascular health. So I'm gonna take you through some of the, the rationale and basic science that um, you know, Dr. Sinatra has laid out for us um, to improve our understanding of how this particular regimen might be beneficial. So coenzyme Q10, who's heard of CoQ10? Lots of people, most people. It's very, um, it's very much in the news and the headlines today, and rightfully so. This is very interesting. Um, we can think of coenzyme Q10. This is, again, in your mitochondria along that membrane where the energy molecules are produced. We have coenzyme Q10 facilitating those chemical reactions at the same time acting as an antioxidant. So it's an electron transport process to produce your ATP molecules. It's facilitating that exchange while mopping up the additional um, electrons that may be scattered or lost that could be damaging to your system. So this is the role of CoQ10 in your mitochondria. It's called ubiquinone because it's in every cell of your body. Your body has to make this typically rather than you receiving it from your diet, although there are some dietary sources. And we'll see that CoQ10 levels tend to decline with age. Supplementation can quite reliably restore cellular content. And the dose can be proportional to the deficiency or the disease state that you might be experiencing. So here's a nice graph. Shows our CoQ10 levels tend to peak at about age 19 or 20. And they are declining thereafter. So here at 40 years of age, anyone here over 40? Your CoQ10 level in your heart can be down to 68%, by 80 years of age down to 43% of, um, of what it once was. CoQ10 is one that I feel particularly comfortable about because a randomized double-blinded trial was conducted and published in 2014, demonstrating in a very scientific and rigorous way, benefits of coenzyme Q10 in the setting of heart failure, congestive heart failure. Uh, so they took 420 patients with moderate to severe heart failure, coenzyme Q10, 100 milligrams three times a day, and they followed them for two years. There was no benefit after 16 weeks, measurable benefit after 16 weeks, so you have to stick with it, but clear benefit demonstrated at the two-year mark. Um, reduction in cardiovascular mortality, reduction in all-cause mortality, reduction in hospital admissions, and improvement in your heart failure functional status, meaning you were actually feeling better and um, performing better on coenzyme Q10 at that 100 milligram three times a day dose. So we have clear guidance that that is acceptable in the setting of heart failure. And that's excuse enough for me, I'm ready to encourage most of my cardiac patients um, even those with arrhythmias and other issues that aren't truly heart failure to say, you know what, this has been demonstrated to be safe and beneficial in hearts, and chances are, are, are that um, you're going to feel better on these things. So um, the Sinatra dose recommendations are close to that trial. If you have arrhythmias, 200 to 400. Moderate congestive heart failure, 300 to 400. Severe heart failure, up to 600 milligrams. And patients with Parkinson's disease, that muscle stiffness, that rigidity, up to 1,200 milligrams a day of coenzyme Q10 can be um, considered as a nutritional supplement for improving symptoms. Um, so it's very interesting. So let's move on now for, from... Um, Coenzyme Q10, I'm going to come back and summarize these at the end, but supplement essential essentials for the heart, magnesium. What's magnesium? Magnesium is an element in your periodic table. It's kind of a metal. Um, exceedingly important for your body. Symptoms of deficiency are in just about every um, organ system of your body, from headaches, dizziness, confusion, um, muscle problems, cardiac arrhythmias, abdominal cramps, urinary cramps, paresthesias, tingling and numbness, um, thigh and calf tightness, cramps um, in your legs and your feet, all evidence potentially of um, magnesium deficiency. 
So a little bit more, the human body has 20 to 25 um, grams of magnesium. Most of it is in bone, the rest is in muscle. It's the fourth most abundant ion in your body. It facilitates 300 enzyme reaction, and it's really concentrated within the mitochondria, that energy factory for your cell where it plays such an important role because it's crucial for reactions involving ATP, for transferring these energy molecules to regions of your cells um, where the energy utilization is important for that cell to function properly. So that's magnesium. Warning signs of magnesium um, deficiency. Fatigue. All my patients tell me um, they're fatigued, and I tell them I'm fatigued. We're all fatigued, you know, but it is the most common and early symptom, and that is because you're having a hard time shuttling your energy around. So it's not getting places where it's needed, and as a result, you feel tired and lethargic. So we can supplement to improve energy. We get personality changes, we get anxiety, we get panic attacks, and um, pediatric um, psychiatrists will often prescribe magnesium supplements to little kids who are having night terrors and um, sleeping problems, things of this nature, and they can respond very well to that. Hard to be toxic because you pee out what you don't need. So very hard to, um, to overdose on these things or over supplement, if you will. It's very safe in that regard. Um, for arrhythmias, very quieting electrically in the heart. So I'm having all of my patients who are able with atrial fibrillation or ventricular arrhythmias or history of sudden death um, to be supplementing, to be supplementing with magnesium. You know, numbness, spasms, cramps, they're so related to muscle function that if you're def deficient, you're gonna start to um, experience muscle irritability and that may be unprovoked. Dizziness, nausea, vomiting, other signs of magnesium deficiency. Thyroid disorders, direct connection between the magnesium and your thyroid and the associated risk of heart disease. Magnesium deficiency can result in an underactive thyroid. So your doctor may have you on a thyroid supplement because your thyroid is truly deficient. The root cause of that may be something as simple as magnesium deficiency and the symptoms attributable to hypothyroidism and to the magnesium deficiency are overlapping. So it can be difficult to um, distinguish. We just lost our, um, audio, our audio visual again. So if we could have um, support from the back, please, you guys back there. I, uh, my screen to here is down, so that makes me think your screens are down. Can you see? They're down, okay. So last time, last time the guys um, figured that out pretty quickly. So it's nice because I know this is, it, it's a really uh, um, a very visual, a very visual talk. So the next slide will be, why are we so magnesium deficient? If this stuff is so important, you know, why is it that we um, have deficiencies? A couple of reasons. One is that we're being robbed by our food. Processed foods, which people are eating too much of, um, are devoid of magnesium. Um, modern farming techniques tend to deplete the topsoil, so it's not making it into your, into your um, food. We're not drinking hard enough water. The water we drink is supposed to have ions in it. And if that mineral content isn't there, over time we're going to be getting magnesium deficient because that's where your body's expecting it from. Also, we're drinking soft drinks. Soft drinks um, contain a lot of phosphate, and the phosphate tends to bind the magnesium and neutralize it, and it doesn't get absorbed. Um, another cause, we're stressed out. Lots of stress, and stress hormones like cortisol use a lot of magnesium um, for their production. So if we're experiencing a lot of stress, we'll burn through our magnesium stores. Um, cortisol has been called the aging hormone. And um, in the absence of magnesium, it will aid you even more quickly. to measure. And why is that? Your body does everything it can to keep the serum or blood levels of mag magnesium normal. So you measure the blood, magnesium's normal. That doesn't mean you're not magnesium deficient. Your tissues could be profoundly deficient, um, propping up this serum level, um, which is not all, at all reflective of um, what's going on um, throughout your body. So, a normal serum magnesium level may give a false sense of security about the status of the mineral in your body and explains why magnesium deficiency often goes unrecognized. Almost every cardiac patient in the hospital um, who comes in who I'm consulted on or are admitted under me gets a gram of magnesium IV every day uh, just as part of routine care. You can measure levels with um, red blood cell tests should you choose. These aren't readily available and I've never in fact um, used one. 
So magnesium is a supplement that I recommend to just about anybody who is seeing me as a patient um, because the benefits are so many and the deficiency is so common and the laboratory measures are so meaningless. We can eat magnesium rich foods provided they are in fact rich in magnesium as they're supposed to be and we can supplement. Magnesium gluconate is, what's perform is what is preferred because it's absorbed so well. The one to, absorb, to, one to avoid is magnesium oxide. If you buy a supplement of magnesium oxide, this is the worst absorbed. Very interestingly, that's the only thing on my hospital formulary that I can order in pill form for admitted patients is magnesium oxide. And um, it's in fact the worst one. You can get um, ionic magnesium drops, you can put uh, magnesium on your skin, and you can soak an Epsom salt bath. So the magnesium can come to you in different ways. For most of us, it's oral supplementation, and a magnesium gluconate or citrate is best. Um, next topic, supplement essentials. What about ATP? We want to increase our ATP levels so we have, we're flooding the market with um, dollars or energy currency to give ourselves the best chance of being energetic. A little bit more cellular basics. This is an ATP molecule. Breaking this is what actually produces the energy that you use. Part of that ATP molecule is a five carbon sugar called ribose, and ribose is very limited in your body. Think about ATP. Heart contains 700 milligrams of ATP. That is enough for 10 heartbeats at 60 beats a minute. So you cycle through that sitting here every 10 beats. Your heart is recycling your ATP pool 10,000 times per day. So it's a busy economy with limited currency. And we think that diseased hearts in times of stress or um, you know, acute conditions, ATP consumption is gonna exceed restoration. Um, the, AD, the, the recycling process becomes somewhat dysfunctional, and the ADP, some of the substrate, will actually leak from your cells, cells leading to additional um, limitations in your reserve. So some of our illness process, I think, is attributable once the, your body is recovering, is the time it requires just for your body to rebuild um, energy currency, and it is potentially possible for us to hasten that process along. So glucose is the sugar we're familiar with. That's a six carbon sugar. It can give you obesity. Ribose is a five carbon sugar. It's a structural sugar. It's not an energy source. It won't make you fat. And um, supplementation is possible. Still sweet, doesn't taste quite like glucose, but still sweet. It is in fact a sugar and um, has a very different role. So we can supplement with D-ribose powder. And um, this is one thing I've actually had taken the step of supplementing on. We can say ribose is minimally present in foods. It's high in red meat, particularly veal. I'm not tempted. Um, ribose availability limits cellular energy. Ribose cannot be stored in cells. The cells have to make ribose when they need it. Ribose synthesis occurs slowly. If you take it as a supplement, it is said to be quickly and easily absorbed from the gut. Over 90% of the supplement dose is absorbed and virtually all that is absorbed is utilized. Sounds like something to consider. So five grams of ribose, recommendation for someone who's healthy, is a little spoonful about like this. Heart failure patients, up to 15 grams of ribose would be three times that amount. Still very small quantities. It tastes sweet, but it's not gonna make you fat or upset your diabetes because it's a structural um, sugar rather than, energy sh rather than an energy sugar. The dose is recommended by Sinatra. You know, healthy living, five grams, and that's um, what I'm ex um, experimenting with right now. And you can see as you develop heart conditions, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and in pro athletes who are really taxing their bodies, even higher supplement doses can be recommended. Probably pretty harmless stuff with potential for um, important benefit. Last one, L-carnitine. What is carnitine? It's the addition of two amino acids. Very interesting. L-carnitine plays a role in the cell, like we said, of moving fatty acids into the mitochondria to be used as energy and moving out the waste products. Um, gives you energy efficiency in low oxygen states. Very synergistic with your CoQ10 and ribose and the heart can be very responsive to focus supplementation at um, times of stress. Really revives the fatty acid metabolism, invigorates mitochondrial function, and can help your heart acutely. 
Um, you know, carnitine, carnitine is carnivore. It's available in meats. Vegan diets and vegetarian diets can be quite low. You can't take more than 2,000 milligrams a day because your gut absorption tends to saturate. And there are powerful cases made for the potential for carnitine and for supplementing with carnitine. Vegetarians tend to lack carnitine. There are a few good vegetarian sources of carnitine. That wonderful avocado shows up again. And if you're not quite a vegan, cottage cheese can contain a fair amount. Tempeh, if we're going to use the fermented soy product, which can be beneficial for other reasons. Um, so there are ways to get this. And um, I think we should very deliberately in our body and in our planning our diets go for um, including some of those sources. And again, in the setting of a heart disease, L-carnitine supplementation promises to improve angina or chest pain, improve the setting of a myocardial infarction or recent heart attack. It can be good in heart failure when there's chamber dilatation and that pump is struggling to recover function. And it can be electrically quieting in the setting of arrhythmias. Sounds good. Sounds very interesting. What the research and paper and um, journals are kind of full of right now is this. Dietary L-carnitine promotes atherosclerosis and renal fibrosis. And the argument is this, when you get carnitine where it's plentiful from meat, -like, from meat sources, when you eat those meat, your gut bacteria are gonna change in response to the meat, and those revised gut bacteria are gonna produce this oxygen called TMAO. TMAO, produced by the bacteria that result from you eating meat, will then accelerate the atherosclerotic process and predispose you to renal fibrosis. They studied veget vegetarians, even vegetarians who they'd give a single serving of meat to. And they found those people had much lower levels of the TMAO than regular meat eaters due to lower levels of the intestinal bacteria that were responsible for converting carnitine in the food to that TMAO substance. Very interesting on the role of um, bacteria. Given that this is a hot topic, um, when I provide supplement lists to patients, I tell them L-carnitine is for vegetarians. So if you're vegetarians or you can really promise me you eat meat only, only very occasionally, then you can consider it. Otherwise, um, I really do discourage anyone from trying it. So this is our cardiovascular awesome foursome, which has good potential to benefit um, cardiovascular health and also um, muscle function throughout our bodies. The doses that um, Sinatra recommends look like this. If you are otherwise healthy, Coenzyme Q10, 100 to 150, magnesium 400, D-ribose 5, a gram of fish oil. And then as the cardiac conditions come along, or even diabetes, those doses tend to move. They tend to get higher in terms of what's recommended. So, you know, reading his testimony and now having experience with my own patients where I have offered D-ribose, or sorry, offered coenzyme Q10 to patients with atrial fibrillation who I'd scheduled for ablation procedures, and they call in a few weeks and cancel their ablation procedures because atrial fibrillation isn't bothering them anymore because they started coenzyme Q10. Those things start to convince you. Or you get the heart failure patient, you know, really severe biventricular failure, like this, you know, it's not good. And, and um, they come back and they say, you know, I left your office with your list. I went to the drugs, to the supplement store. I spent $300. And wow, I'm feeling better. You know, you do hear those stories and it's those anecdotal instances that do um, tend to convince us and leaves me thinking this is something I should at least be making available to people to consider as a supplement with the caveat that carnitine, please avoid it if um, you eat meat in any kind of significant quantities. Warn everybody, this is not approved right now by the FDA, it's not evaluated by the FDA. These aren't the recommendations of the American Heart Association, Heart Rhythm Society, American College of Physicians. Nobody's pushing this. You know, the rationale seems good. Certain cardiologists believe I've had my own good experiences. I'll make it available to you and um, many of our patients do still bite at that opportunity. Um, you know, when you're that ill, sometimes it's like, maybe we should just pull out all the stops and see what we can accomplish. You don't want to scare anyone, but um, I believe the rationale is good, and we've definitely seen um, impressive 
um, examples of success. So in the setting of full disclosure, my supplement regimen, patients always ask me, what do you actually do? You're telling us all this stuff. I do supplement on a multivitamin. Here's my magnesium, here's my L-carnitine, here's my ribose powder. I don't have the CoQ10 on here because I ran out and uh, forgot to put it in. But you know, I really have this stuff at home and um, I'm really taking it, including this morning. 